The story of Serve the World really begins decades ago with uh, Chapel Street's commitment to missions. There was a growing commitment to what Chapel Street could do around the world. How could we be more involved in what God was doing around the world? Somewhere in all that, the idea bubbled up. Uh, might have been somewhere between Dave LeMann, Bruce McAvoy, and me to take that phrase, serve the world, and create that as our mission's emphasis. We started with that concept, almost like a what if we could do this, and we wanted it to truly create a deeper connection for the congregation, not just the money, not just, hey, let's raise money, because God's got all the money anyway, but can we use this to connect people to kingdom work in just a more deep and meaningful way? But we had a problem, and that was uh, while all this interest was growing and we wanted more and more people to get involved in missions, we struggled to um, fund all the things we wanted to fund because we had one church budget and there was a slice in that church budget for missions. And it was really hard to grow that like we wanted to grow it because to grow the little slice of missions in the church budget, you had to take away from other budgets like children's ministry or worship ministries. So we were, we were stuck. How do we get more people involved in missions, how do we grow our whole missions emphasis and how do we fund it in a stronger way than we ever have before? And it was Pastor Brian that said, what if we created a, a separate and distinct fund that people could give to that we could then re-gift and redistribute? And I thought, genius. And we were nervous about that because we were afraid that when you create a separate bucket, bucket other than your in your church budget, your general fund, that people will just kind of rob Peter to pay Paul to take money out of here and then give it to there. But actually what happened was people gave more. And we realized that Serve the World now accomplished both purposes of helping more people see it as something they were involved with. And it created the a, a bucket where people could give. Just watching the congregation engage with the different ministries in a deeper, more meaningful, more impactful way and deepen their heart and their love for a group of people struggling with AIDS in a remote part of Northern Nigeria or uh, in a youth camp in El Refugio in Ecuador. One of the gifts I remember very early was to invest in a skateboard park in Quito, Ecuador. This group of kids I don't feel like is, uh, is hearing uh, the, the, the life-saving message of, of Jesus Christ anywhere else. And the Lord has just has given us a wonderful opportunity. Es impresionante lo que puede hacer Dios. Puso puso en mi camino a Brock, the Rock Skate Church, y, y mi vida cambió totalmente. When you meet people who are living and serving in different parts of the world, and you share kind of fellowship that is really powerful and unique, it kind of took what was my interest into and a desire that I had to, to work for a Christian nonprofit, and it really like fueled that fire. What Serve the World has done for me is given me God's heart for the world. And, and that would be a, a hope for Chapel Street, that we would all be on a journey to have more of an understanding of God's heart for the nations. I get so uh, <laughs> I get so excited watching that and thinking about all that God has done. Um, I could just we just spend the entire time telling stories about all that the Lord has done through Serve the World. I hope that you caught that. It, um, Serve the World is our way of talking about uh, the mission's emphasis beyond our walls, locally and globally, to make an impact. And typically, as Brian mentioned, it's in the budget where you're you're fighting over uh, how much money goes where. And ten years ago made the decision to take that out, and, and, and God has exponentially blessed it. Everything has grown because of the generosity of God's people and the amount of opportunities we've had to bless people all around the world, to further the gospel, has just been incredible. Every year, if you've been around here, you know at Advent season, we tell you a story of one of our Serve the World partners. And there's a big project uh, that they've come to us with that they can't do without help. And so we tell you their story, we encourage you to pray, we invite you to give, and we celebrate what God has done. We've done that a number of times over the years. Last year, you gave $600,000 just in Advent alone to Hope School in Northern Africa, uh, which is amazing. But what you don't get to see is all of the other partners we have. 
What you don't often see is all the, there's 20 something a year, uh, all doing remarkable ministry. We just don't have time to tell you all their stories. And we thought this year, rather than one big singular partner, we want to tell you the story of all of the partners we have as much as we can and celebrate all that God is doing, not just at Advent, but throughout the year and invite you to give. We have set a goal of raising $300,000 over the next four weeks in our Serve the World Fund. And by the way, as you heard, all that money is given away to give away to all of our partners who come to us asking for the resources to do the ministry God has called them to. And so we're going to each week tell you a little more of the stories of our partners in Serve the World who maybe don't make, uh, they don't get the press time of the big one at Advent. We want to tell you their story and invite you to pray for them and give generously to see, and we'll celebrate together what the Lord is doing. Uh, let's bow and, and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, I really uh, thank you for what we saw and for Pastor Bruce's words. You've given us and you are giving us your heart for the world. And we ask that you'd help us, each of us, whatever our role is, to see the people in our world and across the world the way you see them, as image bearers and with love and compassion. Move our hearts uh, to do what you would have us do, not just once a year, but every moment of our lives. Now we, Lord, ask that you would speak to us through your word, because we need to hear from you. We pray this in your name. Amen. As you've heard, today is the first Sunday of Advent season. Maybe you grew up in a, in a home where the church calendar was followed. Maybe you, you didn't. Um, Advent is a season that's not just Christmas time. I think that's a mistake sometimes we make if you're not familiar with this. Advent is a wonderful season of preparation, celebration, and anticipation in the life of God's people. While our culture is busy preparing for the holiday season, with all the noise and the lights and the spending and the, and the eating and the <laughs> buying, and that has its place. I mean, I enjoy the Christmas season. That is not the same thing as the Advent season. And for those of us that celebrate Advent, we prepare our hearts for the coming of the Lord. Advent comes from a Latin word, adventus, meaning arrival. He has come, and we look back and wonder at that. He will come again. We look forward in anticipation of that. And so Advent is a season of preparation and anticipation, full of great hope. Our Advent series over the next several weeks, uh, the next four weeks leading up to Christmas Eve, is called Light and Life. Those two words, you might know them from the hymn, Light and Life to All He Brings, but they're taken right out of John chapter 1. We're going to spend four weeks in 14 verses, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, a remarkable, incredible passage, looking at, at four themes from that passage, the word, the light, the life, and the glory, lifting those themes out, examining them and what they mean for us as we prepare this Advent season. Now, there are lots of wonderful themes and hopeful things and exciting things in this passage, but Fleming Rutledge, by the way, if you're looking for something to read this Advent season, I would commend to you Fleming Rutledge's uh, Sermons on Advent, a collection of them. She says, Advent begins in the dark. And she's right. Physical darkness, the darkness of Bethlehem. Spiritual darkness, the darkness of people lost in sin. It begins in the dark. It doesn't end there, of course, but it starts there. There's a sharp contrast, I think, between the darkness of where Advent begins and this, the bright lights of this season. The quiet dark of prayerful anticipation, a single candle, and then it grows, the light of Christ. So over the next four weeks, we're going to set aside some time together, and I want to encourage you to set aside time in your own life. I know how busy the season can be. I know how, how frantic it can be. So I want to encourage you to intentionally set aside some time to be quiet, to disconnect from the consumer season to pray, and to prepare your heart. In order to do that, we're going to begin by reading each week John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. So let's stand together as we look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life the life that was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. 
the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is God's word. You may be seated. Now I want to remind you of John's stated purpose for writing his gospel. At the end of John's gospel, in John chapter 20, he gives us a purpose statement. Sometimes you're wondering, like, well, what, what is all this for? John tells us what it's for. He says, these are written. He says, actually, Jesus did a whole lot of things that uh, he said and did many things that are not contained in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have life in his name. Why is this written? That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing, have life in his name. That's John's purpose, and quite frankly, it's our purpose as well, to find life in his name by faith in the Son of God. Each of the four New Testament gospel writers present the life of Jesus to us. Their accounts of his life, and they're all in, they're in harmony with each other. They don't disagree, but they each have their own unique lens. So they're, it's like looking at a, a turning a, a diamond and seeing different refractions of light, different aspects of it. And so we look at each of the gospel writers. Matthew presents to us Jesus as the Messiah, the Messianic King. And then Mark gives us Jesus primarily as a suffering servant. Luke uh, is a physician. He's interested in historical details, but he presents to us Jesus, the Savior of all. And John has a very interesting take. He presents to us the divinity of Jesus primarily. Again, each of them talk about each of those themes. But John begins in a very interesting way. Matthew starts with the genealogy, and Luke gives us the account we all know from Linus reading the Christmas story and, and Charlie Brown Christmas, the one we all know really well. Mark doesn't give us much about the birth, and, and John begins in a very different place with this theme of the Word. The Word. That's an interesting word to use, Word. The Word uh, he uses there is a unique Greek word. It's intentionally chosen by John. The Greek word is logos. And it, it has a wide lexical range. That is, uh, it's, it's taken from Greek philosophy, and I've done a ton of reading on this. Uh, it's got a huge range of use. But what it came to mean was the, the first principle behind all things. The reason, rationale, uh, wisdom, purpose behind all reality. That undergirds it all. Heraclitus appears to have been the first Greek philosopher to use this term. Um, and it came to be associated with the rational purpose of the universe, or the cosmos. Different schools of Greek philosophy, so the Greeks looked at the world and thought, there's, there's, there's something going on here that, to make sense of it, we must align ourselves with the logos, the purpose, the impersonal mind, if you will, behind everything. And so the Greek philo philosophical schools were, in a sense, trying to, a different way to align with the logos. The Stoics, right, they believed... Just accept whatever comes without anger or emotion at all. The Epicureans had a different way. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Pleasure. And the Platonic schools and so on. They were trying to align themselves with what they understood the Logos to be. They didn't all agree with what it was, but they're pursuing it. A couple of years ago, I read a book by a, a French atheist philosopher. Not because I read French atheists, but because a friend recommended it to me. Uh, his name is Luke Ferry. Uh, and the, the book is A Brief History of Thought. If philosophy's ever been confusing to you, this is a great read, a brilliant read, actually, even though he's an atheist. Uh, it, here's what he writes about, about the Logos. The Logos for the Greeks was the impersonal, harmonious, divine structure of the cosmos as a whole. But to the shock of the Greeks, the Christians maintained that the Logos, in, in other words, the cosmic principles, was not the harmonious order of the world, but was a single, unique personality one outstanding individual, namely Christ. An atheist wrote that. There is a logos to life. 
There is a principle behind it all. There is something that makes sense of it all. But it's not a pattern of belief. It's not a school of philosophy. It is a person. The person Jesus Christ. Think of what John, John, this is a mic drop moment in history. What John is saying here, in the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was with God and the Logos was God. From the very beginning. So the way that you align your life with the Logos is a relationship with the living God, the man Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a scholar or a philosopher. You just have to know him. A couple of things, well, just five things that, that, that we won't have time to dig into all of these, but that John clearly tells us about the word, the logos. Number one, the word is a person. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. The word is divine, a personal God. The word is eternal. It has always been. The word is the source of all life. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. And the word is Jesus. Uh, Ferry goes on in his book and he says, by resting its case on a definite human person, Christianity had an incalculable impact on the world of ideas. It is quite clear that without this Christian concept of the human person at the center of it all, the philosophy of human rights to which we subscribe today may never have been established. Amazing. An atheist philosopher recognizing that the Christian concept of a personal reality at the heart of all existence, changes everything, unlike anything else, and it still is. So let's take a deeper dive into just a couple of the incredible implications of Jesus as the Word. First, the eternal Word. That might seem obvious, we talk about that, but it's, there's some profound implications for us here. John begins by echoing in the first few verses of John chapter 1, the first few verses of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. Before the world began, God was there. John is telling us that Jesus is the eternal God from the very beginning. He's the only object in the universe that had no beginning. Everything else comes in, into existence through him. John says this. Look at John 1, 1 through 2 again. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. The Word was God, was God and he was in the beginning with God. He goes on to say that nothing that exists came into being except through him. Now, he had no beginning. At the start of everything, he was already there. Now, sometimes we'll read in the Bible, and I've had people ask me this question, well, Jesus is called the Son of God. Sons have a beginning. They're, they have an origin, a beginning. Or Jesus is sometimes referred to in New Testament writings as the firstborn of all creation or the firstborn from the dead. Those sound like beginning moments. Those are not talking about the origins of Jesus. He is the origin of all things. They're talking about his unique role in salvation, his specific identity in redemption and salvation. Only an eternal Christ can offer you eternal life. We talk about that, right? The, the, the greatest gift, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall have what? Everlasting life. Only an eternal Christ can offer you eternal life. The eternal word. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And only one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we have life. Telling us about how God is eternal and the unity of Father and Son. A few, we, a few months ago, maybe close to a year ago now, we memorized Colossians chapter 1, 15 through uh, 19. I'm sure you all still have it ready to go. But in case you might be a little, slipping a little bit, we'll put it on the screen here. And I want you to read this together with me. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Notice that last sentence. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus is before all that exists, and he holds it all together, including you, your life, 
This brings us to the second point, the creating word. John is crystal clear. This eternal word, the logos, that, that has always been, that is behind and underneath uh, and, and, and upholds everything, is also the creator of all that exists. I think sometimes we make the mistake, and I used to, when I was a kid, think about, well, there's God the Father, and he creates, and Jesus, he comes along later and sort of does the saving, and the Spirit, who knows what he does, and we have, sort of have this separation going on. But we're told by John here that the creating agent is the Word, Jesus. He can hold you and everything else together because he brought you into existence. Do you ever make that connection? When you feel like your life is coming apart, maybe... I know that we, there's a lot of happy, clappy, merry, merry stuff going on this season, but for many people that I talk to, it's a hard season. It's a difficult season. It's a painful season. And maybe right now, though you don't talk about it much, you feel like you're coming apart. Do you ever stop to think, Jesus, the Word, can hold you together because he brought you into existence. He, he is the author of your life, not you. That flies in the face of, of contemporary thinking in our secular world, right? I am the master of my fate and the captain of my soul. I determine my life. I'm, I'm writing my story. No, you were written by the creating word who brought you into existence. There's great freedom and security in this if we understand it right. Contrast it with the, the materialist worldview. Burchett and Russell famously wrote in A Man's Freedom of Worship, man is the product of causes that had no prevision of the end they were achieving. Do you follow that? Man, we are the product of causes that didn't even know what they were doing. You are an accident. All, uh, all of the hopes and fears and loves and beliefs are but the accidental collocation of atoms. Everything you feel and think and dream and desire, that's just chemistry. And when you die, it's gone. What a different way to think about your life than the eternal word brought you, spoke you into existence. John is adamant that our life and all that is came into being through this eternal word, the creating word. Now, one of the fascinating, brilliant things I mentioned is that John 1 is clearly echoing Genesis 1. I'm going to read each passage back to back. You'll, you'll, it'll be obvious to you, I hope, some of these, uh, the way that John 1 is echoing the Genesis account. In Genesis chapter 1, the first, uh, 3 through 5, excuse me. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Now we'll jump right to John chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. And all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Over and over again, we see these allusions to light and dark, to God speaking and it coming to existence, and Christ as the word from the beginning of the story of the Bible, we see that God is a speaking God. God says stuff and it happens. He speaks his world into existence. He creates life where there was no life. He brings existence out of non-existence. He creates ex nihilo, we're told, out of nothing. He needs no material. Perhaps you've, you've heard that joke when the, the atheist, God makes man out of the dust of the ground. And the materialist scientist says, well, I can do that. He grabs some dust and the guy goes, uh, 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 get your own dirt. Make your own dirt, right? There's nothing there except the eternal creating word. And he brings it into existence. He speaks and it happens. In the New Testament, we discover that Jesus is the life creating word. And he's also still speaking and bringing life from death. New life, regeneration, recreation to those who are dead in their sins. God is still speaking. His word is still creating, recreating, reanimating, regenerating people that are lost in darkness. We're told this in Hebrews chapter one, verses one through two. Long ago at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. God has spoken and God is speaking in the word, Jesus Christ. Do you hear him? Are you listening to him? In verse five and verse 11 of John chapter one, we're told this, that, um, 
that not everybody did hear, that not everybody did listen or receive or understand. Verse five, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. That word overcome, uh, it's interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a fascinating Greek word um, that um, it's katalambano is the word and it has a, it's translated different ways. In the King James, it's comprehended it not. In the NLT, cannot extinguish. In the New American Standard Bible, it's did not grasp, overcome, understand, comprehend, grasp, conquer. Now, the word can mean like overcome or, or defeat. It can also mean understand, comprehend, or grasp. And I think John likely has both meanings in mind. Without stretching the implications too far, I think one thing that's being said here uh, that John is telling us is there's really kind of two ways to miss Jesus, the word. One is outright rejection, just dismissal, not interested, don't believe, don't agree. The other is to think you know, but not understand, not grasp. Both miss the logos, we're told, both miss out. Some openly reject him. Isn't that true today? Some say nonsense, ridiculous. Others say, yeah, 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 I've heard that. I get that. I believe. But not really understand who he is. This brings us to the, the, the personal word. The word is eternal. The word is the creating agent of your life and all that exists. And the word is personal. It's not an abstract idea or a philosophy. This, this is the great, when I talk to people about uh, Christianity and faith, uh, this is the great misunderstanding. That it's, a, that it's a system that you subscribe to. Uh, Dick Lucas uh, put it this way, imagine a Christian in first century Rome having a conversation with a Roman citizen who's just a pagan worshiper and doesn't understand Christianity but has heard about it. Oh, you're a Christian, that's fascinating. Interesting, tell me about it. Um, where's your temple? Well, we don't have a temple, Jesus is our temple. No temple? Well, where do your priests operate? Well, we don't have any priests, Jesus is our priest. No priests? Well, who offers sacrifices? Well, we don't have sacrifices, Jesus is our sacrifice. This goes on and on, right? And eventually it's like, well, what kind of religion is this? The answer, it isn't one. It's nothing, like nothing else the world has ever seen. It's not a philosophical system you intellectually subscribe to. It's not a religious set of rules that you follow. It's a relationship with the one who is behind everything, who's intimately personal. Look at verses, a couple of verses from John 1 we read earlier again. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the eternal word and the creator of all things and the authoritative word of God, and to ignore him is a serious mistake. Back to this idea of logos for a minute. I, I'm a fan of really good coffee. I, I don't like uh, bad coffee. Good coffee, good. Bad coffee, bad. Right? You got that? And I, and, and I can be a bit of a coffee snob. Uh, and my, it's my wife's fault. But anyway, good, strong, black coffee. And so, uh, but you, sometimes I don't have, I'm in a hurry. And so the Keurig machine, that's, I, that when I first discovered that, that's pretty cool. It makes eh, not terrible coffee, pretty quick. But then I found out about the Nespresso machine. You know the George Clooney machine? I, found, I have an Nespresso machine in my office and at home. Now, it's not, it's not quite as good as real espresso, but, I, but it's pretty good. And there's a way to use it. I love it. When you put that, it smells incredible. It makes a little foam on top, and I get it on my lip. It's the greatest thing. Anyway, so there's a, there's a, there's a logos for the, for the espresso machine, a particular way you're supposed to use it, right? There's a design and an intent and a reason for its existence. If I bought that thing for however much it costs, I won't tell you, and I use it as a doorstop for my office door, it might work, but it's not what it's made for. What a shame. Think of what you're missing out on, the aroma, the taste of really good coffee. You don't have it all. All you got is a thing, hold the door open. When, when the New Testament and the, all of Scripture says, you shall have no other God before you except me, 
and make my son Jesus the very center of your heart and life. This is not uh, some arbitrary standard and forcing you into. It's an invitation to experience life the way God intended it. To get all that he has for you out of it. In John chapter 3, verse 36, we read, Whoever believes in the Son has life. Whoever does not believe shall not see life. We could, you could read that and think, okay, if I don't believe in Jesus, God's going to punish me and get me. Not, no. That's not really what he's saying. It's an invitation to life. To align your life with the one who made you in his image, who loves you, who died for you, who is behind everything anyway. It's the best kind of life you could possibly have. Why, why, why use it for a doorstop when you could have all that God intends through a relationship with Jesus? If you, if you go to a doctor, you're having some heartburn, you know, this Christmas you eat too much, which you know, may, may happen, and you have a little heartburn, and you go, oh, I better, I need, it's not going away. You go see a doctor, the doctor says, look, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is there's an issue, solution, but the bad news is you've got really high cholesterol. Uh, and, and you're in trouble if you don't change your eating habits and your lifestyle. And here's what you need to do. And you walked out going, nah, he's a quack. He doesn't know anything. And you go right back to overeating. Right? And the doctor doesn't need, doesn't need to fine you or have you arrested or put you on some list, a watch list, right? You are living outside of the Lagos, in, in a sense. And you will reap the, the consequences. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word is God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and invites you into a personal relationship with him. It's not trying to impose some arbitrary standard on you. In verses 12 and 13, we're told, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children not born of natural descent or of a husband's will, but born of God. This new gift, this relationship with the personal God is something you can only receive. You don't achieve it. You don't earn it. You don't acquire it. You don't grasp it for yourself. You simply receive it. One more time, a quote from Luke Ferry, our favorite French atheist philosopher this morning. Listen to what he says toward the end of his book. Close, close to the end of his book, after writing eloquently about the Christian understanding of suffering and pain and grief and resurrection, he, he notes this. I find the Christian proposition infinitely more tempting than Buddhism and Stoicism, except for the fact that I don't believe in it. But were it to be true, I would certainly be a taker. I find this fascinating. It reminds me of a conversation Jesus had in the Gospels in Mark chapter 12 with a, a, a religious leader who comes asking sincere questions. And at the end, Jesus, when he recognizes this guy's sincerity, he says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. I find it fascinating, this, this French atheist goes, look, on the face of it, this is the best deal going. This is the best way. I just don't believe it. Perhaps he's not far from the kingdom of God. Perhaps you aren't either. Friends, I'll just leave you with this, this statement that you can take with you in your mind and heart. You'll see it here on the screen. Jesus is the word. He is the eternal word that holds all things together, including your life. He is the creating word that knit you together in your mother's womb. And he is the personal word that will come into your heart and change your life. This is what John is saying to us. He was there before anything else was there, before you were there. He had you in mind. He brought you into existence. He's given you life. And he invites you into a relationship with him. There, there is no other purpose, right? John says, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and by believing have life in his name. When the Advent season comes and goes this year, may we have life in his name. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the living word, the eternal word, the creating word, and the personal word to us. And to ignore your word is a serious thing. So help us to listen this Advent season. For many of us who are here, we, we know you. We have received. But we drift. So bring us back into alignment with the logos of life. And I know there are some 
who know about you or think they do, but they have not received. Lord, might, might they hear again your promise that to all who receive, who believe in your name, you give the right to become children of God, born from your heart, aligned with your heart. We thank you, Lord Jesus, our word. Amen. He is the first word and the last word and every word in between. And if you know him as your Savior, I invite you now to observe the Lord's Supper together. Peel off that bottom layer. And as you do so, I remind you that Jesus called himself the bread of life. He said to his disciples, this is my body. It is given for you. Eat this in his memory. Scripture tells us that after they had eaten together, Jesus poured out a cup, and he said to them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And we're told that every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim his death until he returns. As we wait for the advent, his second arrival. Let's do that together. Now may you go in the grace, mercy, and life-giving power of Jesus, the Word made flesh. Amen. And go in peace.